I'm going to be talking to Gilbert Michaud, who's an assistant professor of environmental policy at Loyola University in Chicago, and his research focuses on renewable energy policy, electricity markets, and sustainable economic development. And we're going to be talking about is clean electricity and clean electric, uh, sort of clean tech, uh, a competitive advantage these days. So welcome to the interview, Gilbert. Yeah, thanks. Uh, pleasure to be here. Happy to chat with you. Well, look, let, um, let me just kind of, we'll start out at the highest level and work our way down to Ohio where you're located and, um, and talk about some specifics. So it seems like, you know, 2020-ish, a lot of the uh, clean energy technologies that, you know, wind and solar and batteries and EVs and heat pumps and so on became competitive. And they started to, you know, sales started to expand. And China had a lot to do with with expanding both, you know, scaling up, driving down costs, driving adoption. And it now seems like the very often it's the clean technologies on both the demand and supply side that are the most economic choice. Is that a fair way to describe this? Yeah, definitely. Um, I've been in this field for you know over a decade at this point, doing pointed research on renewable energy and clean tech, and costs have gone down just so dramatically over the past decade, in particular. Um, I don't know if uh, COVID and you know in the past five years in particular there was sort of a, a threshold or a, a focusing event or shift that happened uh, necessarily at that point, but um, I think it is a good marker in the past five years or so where. Uh, all of these technologies are just really cost competitive now, even perhaps without policy incentives. But we're going to see what that looks like uh, pretty shortly here, especially in the U.S. Now, you're an economic modeler, an energy modeler. Tell us about some of the work that you've done in terms of wind and solar batteries being competitive with other sources of generation. What kind of economic impacts they create? Sure. So uh, I do a lot of, you know, I'm an academic, right? So I teach my classes and write my papers, but I do a lot of applied and engaged research with industry folks. So solar, wind, battery developers specifically, and also electric utilities. And the competitiveness is sort of uh, proven, if you will, just in the fact that they're building all of these new projects, right? And as, uh, as a result of that, they reach out usually to different consultants or academics who have uh, expertise in certain types of modeling to do you know, crunch some numbers, write these reports for regulatory bodies to get approvals for different projects, right? So if you want to build, for instance, just a tangible example, a large scale solar project, you as a developer usually have to get building permits through a state or local agency. And in order to do that, you have to do a soil impact study, a wildlife impact study, a water impact study, et cetera. And so uh, my background is in economics and I do a lot of economic modeling, as you suggested. And so I get a lot of outreach from folks that say, hey, Gilbert, we want to build this new wind or solar project or something. Can you tell us how many jobs and can you tell us what the wages and the tax revenues and all that kind of stuff looks like? Uh, and so in short, you know, we break this down into what we call the construction phase and the operations phase. There's sort of two different phases of interest when we're doing that modeling. The construction phase, as the name indicates, is, you know, it might take a year or so to build a project. We need all these laborers like on the site actually building uh, out like a, a big solar farm or something. And that's a one time economic impact that uh, is felt. And then once it's connected to the grid, generating clean electricity, we move into what's called the O&M or the operations and maintenance phase. So we have engineers who are monitoring performance. We have folks that are going out to the site to do cleaning or checking wires or something and all that kind of stuff. And so we can model how many jobs uh, those projects will create once they're in operation the wages that are paid, the tax revenues that are going into communities uh, and that type of thing. And what are the impacts? Are they significant? Yeah, they're very meaningful, um, especially in the construction phase. So to build out, let's say, you know, the average 100 or 200 uh, megawatt solar wind projects, which is pretty average uh, these days, at least in the US, uh, we're talking about hundreds of jobs typically uh, in the O&M phase when we move to the operations phase, like the jobs are less. It is a knock that some of the opposition groups sort of point out. Uh, and it is true, right? Like you probably only need five or 10 people to operate a project. The other side of that perhaps is it depends on what variables matter to folks, right? I would maybe argue um, that solar or wind is like a less laborious way to generate electricity and it's clean. So if we care more about emissions and public health, 
uh, you know, maybe that's a variable that needs to be weighed instead of just a jobs to jobs comparison. When I think about clean electricity, I think about it in terms of uh, backward linkages, forward linkages, and technology linkages. So how are those, so backward inputs into the, into the solar farms, wind farms, forward, you take the electricity and do something with it. Technology, it has something, you know, you're either using technology or developing technology that then goes on and has an impact in the economy. What kind of linkages come from these kinds of, uh, you know, wind and solar developments? Yeah, they're, they're meaningful. I'll try my best if I understand your question properly. I think in the backwards way, like if we think about supply chain, for instance, we have a lot of wiring, racking systems, especially in solar, turbine manufacturers, solar panel manufacturers, all these like really well-paying jobs that basically employ a lot of engineers, frankly, folks that have master's degrees that are well-paid. Uh, that work at all of these big manufacturing facilities that are building all of this infrastructure. And then even like, you know, having folks that work in truck transportation or something that are shipping it out to the sites, projects are getting built. All of that is like a huge layer of economic development. And then to your other point, like on the other end of it, um, you know, it's, it's a, we have cheap, reliable uh, emissions free electricity that we're generating it's kind of a carrot for economic development on the other side where you see a lot of, I think especially tech companies, Google, Facebook, Amazon, you know, folks that have 100% sustainability missions or greenhouse gas uh, reduction uh, goals or something like that, that want to have clean energy as part of their solution. So it actually it drives them to sort of say, hey, we want to build three new data centers in sub some suburban you know, area somewhere in the Midwest or something. We want to go where we know that we can get clean energy. To what extent is uh, clean electricity, reliable electricity, cheap electricity, a factor in site selection, you know, if it's a manufacturing industry or whatever it is, but, you know, when folks, they've got a list and they rank them, where would uh, clean electricity sit on that list? It's huge. I would put it maybe one or two. Um, when I was doing a lot of work uh, in Ohio, like you mentioned, and other like agencies that I work with in the Midwest and here in Chicago, uh, I worked with a group called Jobs Ohio, and they're sort of the state's economic development arm. And so they very pointedly uh, would work with site selection folks and talk to the prospective companies that wanted to come into the state, to Cincinnati or Columbus or, or what have you. And they always said, we want to make sure that we have cheap and reliable power and basically access to all types of utilities. They need water, they need electricity, they need it to be reliable, it needs to be running 24 seven, especially for you know manufacturing facilities, data centers, that type of thing. So the state agency knows this, the governor even knows this, and they work directly with the utilities to make sure that they can make that happen. They also offer um, oftentimes like what we call rate concessions. So they'll give a little cheaper of an electricity rate uh, to like a big company that might wanna come in because they know that they'll come in and create a lot of jobs uh, for locals in the community and like generate a lot of tax revenues, right? So uh, that's another sort of economic uh, development angle that um, these agencies often take. But yeah, it's super important. Now, we, we've seen a big discussion, you know, from 2021 up until recently when President Trump, you know, sort of gutted a lot of the, the Biden era uh, programs like uh, Inflation Reduction Act and Infrastructure Act and so on. But it seems like uh, despite that, there still is a lot of construction going on of things like battery plants. Supply, or they may be plants that are in the supply chain for solar panels, wind turbines, whatever it is. Uh, is that a fair to say? Is there a fair amount of that activity going on? And you know, do they need clean electricity? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of movement in the battery space. Um, just as a personal anecdote, I have a lot of former students that worked like in my research group that went off to work for developers or utilities. And now when I talk to them, they're like, hey, Dr. M, we're mostly doing batteries at this point. So they've even made this transition internally and in, within their companies from doing wind and solar development. And now they're doing a lot of battery storage development. And I think, yeah, to your point, we're seeing you know these tax credits expire the investment tax credit uh, here in the U.S. under the Inflation Reduction Act that was uh, expanded out to 10 years under President Biden and is now going to you know, go away as we move into 2026. 
uh, is going to really change the game, I think, for a lot of developers uh, that won't get that financial incentive. And frankly, a lot of uh, communities that could host wind and solar projects have almost become like oversaturated with proposals. There's so many projects that are in all these state and like regional queues. And, you know, it's taking a long time, frankly, to get projects built. But there's already a ton of projects that are built uh, or like under construction. And if we can harness that electricity at times of need, right, the wind usually blows more at night, obviously, and the sun is shining, obviously, during the day. Um, and then we can store it and harness it at times of need and peak demand periods, like in the morning or people come home after work at night or something. Uh, that'll be an advantageous thing to everyone. Now, uh, when I think of Ohio, I think of a, a kind of as a Rust Belt state. Used to have a lot of manufacturing, then a lot of that manufacturing migrated to China and offshore, and now is coming back. And and the clean uh, elect, you know, electric technologies are playing a big role in that. Is that a fair way to look at Ohio? Yeah, I think that's an accurate representation. Ohio has a legacy, of course, uh, especially in like the northwestern port of the, portion of the state of like the automotive industry, the glass industry was really big there, definitely big Rust Belt uh, area. And then in the southern parts of the state, depending, you know, east or west, we have a lot of agriculture in the uh, western part of the state where it's flatter. And then a lot of honestly, like legacy uh, resource extraction and fossil fuels in the southeast part of the state, uh, which is in the shale plays and also like in the coal country. So those industries, if you will, of sort of guided economic development and industrial growth in Ohio for decades. Uh, but as things have shifted over over time, of course, you know, a lot of the glass manufacturers and the auto manufacturers like refurbish their plants to be things like clean energy manufacturing facilities. Uh, a tangible example for folks, uh, if they want to look it up as a company called First Solar, they're always flipping back and forth as the largest or second largest uh, solar uh, manufacturer in the entire U.S. And they're huge. They provide a lot of uh, panels and other types of components uh, to projects that are being built here, uh, which, you know, increases economic development. When we're doing this modeling that I was talking about earlier, uh, we can change the percentages of local materials that are used and also local uh, labor that is used. And so when we say, hey, you know, we're importing every single component of this project from overseas and we're bringing in crews from California or Texas or something like that, like that's going to have a less of an economic impact, uh, obviously. But when we say, hey, we can actually buy all of these panels from like this local company that's here in Ohio, and we can actually, if we do proper workforce development, employ folks that are locals to help us build this project, uh, then those numbers rise uh, considerably. So it's an economic development thing ultimately as well. What about on the manufacturing side, though? Is manufacturing coming back uh, and especially around the clean tech sector? Yeah, there's a couple maps uh, that are online resources for folks to look at that shows some of the growth. And this was sort of Biden era IRA kind of stuff that said, hey, we want to like restore a lot of these operations. Uh, you can look at uh, some of the clusters where there's wind and solar manufacturers that have been popping up uh, in the Midwest, definitely. And I think the South is a high growth region. So like Georgia and around Atlanta and that area, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, solar manufacturing as well. Um, and so, yeah, there's there's a lot happening right now. And I think it's a, a directive of President Trump as well to make sure that we have a lot of like American made products. It's a big movement right now. Uh, Gilbert, if I had uh, if I asked you to look out into the future, uh, polish your crystal ball, uh, <laughs> look out in you know two to five years what do you see happening in this space in Ohio? Yeah, I think it's tricky. I think, you know, federal policy does matter a lot. I think with um, the Trump administration slashing the investment tax credit and the production tax credits, those are going to have an impact, frankly, on the industry. Um, we'll see how it, it shakes out. I think in the short term, we'll have this huge wave of projects being built and even like things like local solar, uh, rooftop solar, residential style solar, right, that is built prior to the end of this year. But moving into 2026, 2027, and maybe beyond, uh, I think it'll become less financially feasible for some folks. But I think also the costs have just gone down so much. I think uh, laborers know how to build projects. A lot of this is streamlined nowadays. And I think the costs uh, for the equipment itself is very cost competitive. 
I don't see us building more, you know, coal-fired power plants necessarily, right? Nuclear is a tough thing. It takes many decades, frankly, to get projects approved and built. Um, so I still think the movement is toward, you know, renewable energy and specifically probably solar and wind. Um, it'll just it'll change the game a tiny bit with the tax credits going away. Uh, but I still think it's cheaper than most other energy sources at this point. Now apply that same kind of, you know, crystal ball gazing to the demand side, the manufacturing of, you know, the batteries and whatever other devices uh, are, are required to use electricity. Yeah, this is tough right now because everyone is talking about AI, right? So we're building all these data centers, technology is changing so fast. Three years ago, no one knew what ChatGPT is. Now everyone uses it like Google, right? And so uh, with that becomes, you know, I work at a sustainability school. There's a lot of folks that talk about the environmental impacts of all of this, uh, whether it is water to cool things or, or whatever. But a lot of it in my space and the electricity space is we have a growing demand, probably a high, like a steeper curve than normal with all of the tech booms and the AI. Uh, how do we make sure that we meet that demand, but also do it in a sustainable way, right? Um, I think there's going to be some growing pains. Frankly, we're going to, you know, I think utilities will try to hold on to some of their fossil fuel uh, assets uh, and like keep them alive for a little bit longer. A lot of these were built in the 60s and are nearing the end of their life. Uh, but, you know, they'll try their best to keep some of the gas and coal plants open to meet that really growing demand. But I think it also begets more demand, if you will, for, for building more new generation assets like clean energy. Uh, so I think that will ultimately drive it. The business demand for renewables is like probably the biggest driver, even more so than policy, I would say. It's the like I was saying before, the tech companies that say, hey, we, we have a 100% renewable energy mission. We have that goal that we need to meet. We need to build more of these data centers with this tech boom please come build us a wind and solar farm right at our site because we need it. Gilbert, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate it. Yeah, this has been fun. Thanks for inviting me.